Robert Stephen Kapp, today's guest, recently concluded a term as the President and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas. He is co-chair of the venture philanthropy leader Draper Richards Kaplan Foundation. Robert will share insights about his work and his superpower. I'm your host, Devin Thorpe. Welcome to the Superpowers for Good show. Rob, thank you so much for joining me again. It is just a thrill to have you back. Great to be with you, Devin. Always good to talk to you. Yeah, I, I want to uh, remind our listeners that uh, you were the very first guest I ever had on the show. Uh, you know, I, I'm 1,500 episodes in, and I've had some, oh some great people on the show, but uh, but you were guest number one. So it's a thrill right. to have you back. I'm glad uh, you recovered. <laughs> It's a, it's a delight. It's a delight. You know, um, you are doing, you, you've had a super remarkable career, Goldman Sachs, Federal Reserve, Harvard. Oh my gosh. But, but uh, your work with Draper Richards Kaplan uh, continues to inspire me above all else. Um, as you look at the world today, what do you see as being sort of the, the trends that, uh, signify the challenges we're facing that and uh, that are different than maybe five years ago, ten years ago, twenty years ago. So a number of the thorny problems that we face in the United States and around the world have to do with uh, wealth and income inequality, and uh, I guess I put this in quotes: at-risk populations. Uh, and, and I think we're increasingly realizing in the United States and around the world that the extent that we have more inclusive prosperity, it's better for society, it's better for everyone. And so I think what, what Draper Richards Kaplan's trying to do is address a lot of the persistent issues for uh, a, a number of uh, at-risk populations, whether it's early childhood literacy, education, digital divide, uh, diet, uh, uh, ways for women in a number of emerging countries to be able to make a living, uh, uh, environmental issues. There's a whole range of issues, skills training and so on. There's a whole uh, range of issues that are affecting populations around the world. And the issues are, tough in that it's hard for governments. Governments play a very critical role, but there are limits to what governments can do. And sometimes you need a social entrepreneur to really get in and provide a disruptive solution that uh, is gonna address some of these issues. And and I can tell you, I'm at Draper, Richards Capital, DRK, probably see over a thousand proposals a year. And I'm always amazed by the ideas that social entrepreneurs have to provide a disruptive solution that we just wouldn't have thought of, but these social entrepreneurs are thinking of, and we try to back those entrepreneurs to, to create sustainable nonprofits so they can further those disruptive solutions. You, you've been at this for a while now. Um... It's sort of a, let's take just a quick step back and talk about the model uh, of venture philanthropy. I think uh, many people would agree that uh, DRK is the leading firm in this space. That no one's doing it better, but, but describe the model for venture philanthropy. So we have stayed with pretty much the same model since we started. Um, Number one, we, we only provide 100,000 a year for three years. So in the scheme of things, we're not the, we're not the big funder in these situations. I would, call, I would say we provide more sponsorship. Number two, we put a managing director on every single board and we act like an owner for the three years that we're on the board. And the things we really bore in on uh, are helping uh, the leader, the social entrepreneur or social entrepreneurs in a, in a venture build a team, refine the model, develop their own leadership skills, 
Uh, and the, the other thing that we're trying to do is make sure that they have an impact that can be documented as appropriate, can scale if there's an opportunity to scale. Uh, and then we're, we're, we're the, sometimes the hardest thing to do is build out the board and help convince a social entrepreneur that while they've done this so far themselves, uh, they need to build a team. But part of building a team is to have a board of directors. It can be invaluable. And so that when we roll off in three years, what we want to see is a sustainable social enterprise uh, that can function without our direct involvement. Right, right. It's, it's building capacity. It's interesting you talk about uh, boards. Um, what what do you see make, uh, what are the characteristics of a good board member and a strong board? So the first time in the nonprofit sphere, the first time you mention the term board, people think uh, money, fundraising, right? Well, that's part of it. Uh, but what we want to see is coaches for a social entrepreneur and some social entrepreneurs desperately want coaching, want to keep learning, keep developing. Um, and so, so, so some social entrepreneurs may see a board of directors, a bit of a burden, you know, I don't have time for this and bureaucracy and uh, gee, we've done so well by ourselves. And, and so our job is to help them uh, create a board that can coach them, coach their team, maybe see things they don't see, you know, address their blind spots. And yes, uh, it can be an enormous uh, addition in terms of raising money and that you can leverage your board to help raise money so you're not doing it all by yourself. And one of the issues from taking a concept, improving the concept, taking that to creating a sustainable organization is having a board of directors that can provide those, those functions. And, and we found that often is the difference over the long run or medium term between being sustainable and not being sustainable, including the idea that sometimes social entrepreneurs want to do something else and you need to create succession and depth so that the enterprise can go on and the board can play a critical role in that. One of the things you mentioned too was the importance of documenting impact. And it's really a challenge, I think, for young startup, nonprofit, social entrepreneurs to do this because there's a tension between uh, a desire, a need, the importance of documenting, measuring impact on the one hand and the burden of that, right? Uh, it can overwhelm, the task of trying to measure can overwhelm the uh the the project in a way and, and but furthermore if you don't start with the uh measurement early you may never be able to measure there's some things that will be lost to history and you may never know if it worked if you don't make the measurements early how do you deal with all of that yeah so my own belief and i'm speaking now as a as a business person metrics and measurement is not the be all end all on the one hand on the other hand, anecdotes are also not enough. Uh, and if you go into many nonprofit board meetings, you know, there's lots and lots of anecdotes. Uh, and, and sometimes that is misleading too. So the, the trick is how do you assess how you're doing? Um, and how do you success the impact you're making? And it varies by organization. And I don't think one size, one size certainly doesn't fit all, but you got to work with entrepreneurs say, how do we know whether the concept is working? How do we know whether the model is working? Uh, that you're having a positive impact on the constituencies you're trying to serve. And the other thing often, which affects sustainability, is it be done in a reasonably cost-effective way. You have to sense how, how expensive is this? And Initially, people don't worry about that latter point, but over time, especially if you're trying to scale, you, you want to feel like you're delivering an impact that's affordable, sustainable, uh, that makes sense. And so I don't have the answer in each situation, 
but I think we start with asking the question and trying to come to grips with an approach. And we're very willing to tailor that approach with the entrepreneur to the, to the enterprise uh, that they're conducting. So, you know, we do, uh, we do all sorts of enterprises which are completely different and the metrics ought to be completely different or there ought to be some other kind of assessment that maybe is not so easy to measure, but there has to be some type of assessment. Maybe it's a survey of the constituents, for example, that's the assessment. Um, but, but you got to wrestle for that. Uh, and so we, we do like to do that. Yeah. As you reflect on the work that you have helped lead at DRK, what are you most proud of having accomplished? So I'm very proud of first, the social entrepreneurs that started out as emerging leaders, had an idea, probably had a concept that was already uh, already proven. Remember, we're early stage. We're, mm -hmm. we're late enough that they've proved the concept. There's been a beta test, but we're not so late that they're already very well developed. You know, they still need help. And I'm very proud at the number of social entrepreneurs and leaders who have helped build their teams and create sustainable enterprises that have a consistent impact that made a positive, positive uh, impact on the world. Um, I'm also very proud of having built, working on building the DRK organization. We've got, uh, we've got now senior leaders, and I could rattle off a bunch of names, Jim Bilner, Stephanie Carana, and, and a cast of others, uh, along with Bill Draper and Robin Richards, uh, who, who work with me to help uh, start this. Um, but it's not easy to build an organization, and we, went through a lot of growing pains. Today we have 36 employees, we have probably nine or 10 managing directors, but it took us years to learn how to run that kind of organization, how to create a sustainable process, how to do an incubate or help uh, uh, be a catalyst for 20 to 25 new ventures every year. All those things, we went through a lot of growing pains over the years and so I'm proud at how far we've come. And, and I must, I'd be the first to admit, we're still learning. If I could, I, I would never tell you we got this figured out. We, uh, we, we will never have this figured out. We're learning all the time and open to learning. You are doing important, important work, life-saving work, uh, planet-saving work. Uh, why is that important to you? So I've always been uh, excited, always, I've always had a passion for creating uh, new, uh, new ideas and taking new ideas and putting them into action uh, with the purpose of making a positive impact in the world. That's, that's, that I always felt like my role was to add more value at that stage. I, I was a leadership professor, as you know, at Harvard for 10 years. I'm a big believer in leadership and coaching and development, but I love uh, and I'm excited about uh, taking a, a leader, a social entrepreneur with a passion idea and turn it into something uh, that helps them reach their dreams and make a positive impact. And uh, that's my passion. It's always been my passion. Uh, and, and I've tried to find different approaches to help people do that, uh, you know, vision, priorities, and alignment, helping people better understand themselves. Um, and so um, that's always been important to me. And that's, that's, that's been a driving force. That passion has helped drive me force. And I happened to meet years ago in, uh, you know, 2008, 2009, Robin Richards and Bill Draper, who had the same passion that I did, but, but complementary. They were two venture capitalists. I was uh, a, an investment banker and a business person and then a leadership professor. And, and we found that we sort of married our passions and interests to try to do the same thing. That's fantastic. Uh, you've had such an exceptional career. I mean, truly, uh, you know, an American giant. What, what do you see as your superpower? Uh, it's, I don't know that I have a superpower uh, and I wonder that, that every day. I think the most uh, 
important thing that I've clung to over the years is a willingness and a desire to learn and to keep learning, to be self-critical. I may, I, I hate to tell you, I make mistakes all the time. Uh, and I'm conscious of the fact that uh, I'm never going to quite get this right. And so, uh, I, I'm highly motivated to learn and to keep learning. But the other thing I'm wholly, highly motivated by is coaching and helping to develop others. Um, and I'm always trying to do that better, but helping people reach their potential. Um, and But my willingness and openness to learn has probably been uh, the most important guiding light in, in what I've done. Could you give us an example of a time where that openness, willingness to learn uh, changed an outcome for the better? Something you're proud of that you could re reflect on and say, wow, that it really was pivotal in this situation. Well, it's probably everywhere I've been. Uh, you know, I went from Goldman Sachs to Harvard Business School. I found very quickly that the same leadership approach that I took at Harvard, if I continued, if that I took at Goldman, if I continued that at Harvard, they were going to shoot me. <laughs> it, I had to adjust my style and I, 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 and I was a little bit jarring to me, but I learned quickly, you've got to, you've got to understand the context, the situation you're in and adapt your style. I learned the same thing when I went from Harvard to the Fed. Fed's got a very different culture uh, for decades, and you've got to understand the context and then try to adapt your style. And uh, at, at times in organizations I've been in, even at Goldman Sachs, I was countercultural. And to a point, that's fine. But I think the biggest mistakes I've made have been I, I know how to do this. We're going to do it this way. We're going to do it my way. And I realized after getting my brains beat in, I needed to adapt and understand the context. And I, I've gotten better at that in making the transition to Harvard and then being a senior associate dean at Harvard. Not perfect. And uh, making the transition uh, uh, to the Fed and now making the transition from the Fed to what I'm going to do next. Um, I'd say... My biggest setbacks have been the failure to adapt fast enough, but my biggest strengths have been a realization that whatever style worked in one situation, you're going to have to develop new skills and maybe adjust your style to be effective in the next one. Yeah. As you think about the value that this trait has provided you over your career, and it's, it, it's clear to see, the, the benefits of this willingness to learn. Uh, how would you coach other people to develop that? Uh, it, it isn't just a mindset. I think it's more than that. How do you, how do you develop it? So having made my own mistakes and gone through my own pain and suffering in points, it's made me more, it's made me much more empathetic. So I, I probably, there's not a day that goes by where I don't, have a conversation with one or more leaders who are going through some type of hardship challenge or and often a transition. And I think that one of the biggest things I've been able to do is tell them, boy, I'm struggling with that myself. And you're not alone. Uh, it, it's, it's typical to struggle with this. Uh, it's okay to ask a question, to seek advice, to admit you don't know to admit you were wrong. And I think one of the things I've been able to do is give people, I hate to say the word, permit, almost permission. I mean, I've met, I screwed this up. I don't know. I made a mistake. And I think being willing to say that and, and, ex, ex, and talk to people who have used to being top of their class and always, you know, the top of everything they've done, you know, being able to admit you're wrong or you need to learn or you need advice, be vulnerable, be authentic. Uh, I think I've been able to share that with people and, and I think it's helped them realize that that's fine. In fact, if you're a strong, confident person, the stronger, more confident you are, the more you should be willing to admit maybe you don't know or you were wrong or apologizing occasionally for screwing up, uh, that kind of thing is okay. 
Now, that's that's really powerful insight uh, because so many of us struggle with aspects of that. Uh, Rob, you mentioned you're you're on you're on to a next thing. Is that to something that we uh, that you know what it is, or are you exploring new opportunities? I'm, ex I'm exploring it right now. I, I mean, for me, I've got a self-imposed cooling off period uh, from my from my last job. So what I've been doing, I've been out speaking. And I do lots of strategy work for companies uh, as well as not-for-profits. Um, I'm not accepting any uh, financial compensation for anything I do here for, for, the, for the year. Uh, but by the end of this year, I pro I, I'm, I'm, I'm gravitating and having conversations where I'll, I may go work now in one more enterprise, probably in business, uh, do one more stint in the business world. and. Uh, I'll probably make that decision by the end of this year, beginning of next year. But in the meantime, I'm sort of uh, dusting off and getting back in sh old muscles and getting back in shape with helping businesses and nonprofits and leaders with vision, priorities and alignment, which is a whole framework we talk about separately, helping, helping people reach their potential, helping organizations reach their potential. And so it's really been fun and actually a lot more fun than I expected. I'm, I'm really enjoying it. No, fantastic. Well, Rob, it's a thrill to have an opportunity to catch up with you. Before we wrap up, we, I wonder if you'd take a minute and tell people how to learn more uh, about DRK. Uh, and if there's other things you want to connect them to, feel free. Uh, but uh, particularly if people want to reach out to you, what's the, let them know what's the best way to, to connect with you personally. So um, I'll give you, I think the Look at the Draper Richards Kaplan website. We we uh, we profile what we're trying to do, and we 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 profile each of our organizations, uh, past you know our graduates as uh, graduate fellows as well as our current uh, enterprises, and and I think there's information on that website on how to contact us. You can also find me on Twitter or on LinkedIn, uh, and uh, you know I'm getting people reaching out regularly and I, I I enjoy if I can be helpful I enjoy being helpful but I'd, I'd start with look at the DRK website and if there's something there intriguing you um, contact us through that website or you can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter or other social media sites but those are probably the two I throw out fantastic well again Rob thank you so much for being here today we wish you every success in your continued work at innovating solutions to the world's big problems at DRK and elsewhere. All right. Thank you, Devin. Great to talk with you. And thanks for all that you're doing. All righty. Let's do some good. Thank you for tuning in to the Superpowers for Good show. Twice each week, we host changemakers who share their impact, insights, and superpowers. Don't miss another episode. Subscribe today at superpowersforgood.com. That's superpowers, number four, good.com. Be super empowered. Get your copy of the book, Superpowers for Good, as an ebook, audiobook, paperback, or hardcover edition via your favorite online retailer. Interested in having me speak to your company, organization, or association? Visit devonthorpe.com. Then let's talk. Now, keep using your superpowers for good. Together, we can reverse climate change, improve global health, and eradicate poverty.